Hello, everyone. I am Ross Anderson, Deputy Editor of The Atlantic. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today and for supporting our journalism. We are here today to, today to talk about The Atlantic's first feature documentary, White Noise, which follows three leaders of the alt-right movement. And we're going to be talking with the filmmakers themselves uh, about how this movement figures into today's politics and most importantly, where we go from here. Uh, joining me are the film's director, Daniel Lombroso, its executive producer, Kasha Cheplock Meyer von Baldeg, and Adam Harris, my colleague on the Atlantic's politics team. Uh, welcome to you all. Daniel, I'm going to start with you uh, since you directed this film um, and really endured the company of its subjects, uh, uh, which we'll get into a bit later. But talk us through the genesis of this film. How does one come to uh, want to make a documentary about the alt-right? Yeah, so I started covering the alt-right in, in 2016. I saw a lot of the trends that people are familiar with now. You know, racism and anti-Semitism was surging online and coalescing behind candidate Trump. You know, at the time, a lot of these groups were not getting cover coverage, and I brought it to Kasha, who was the head of our department at Atlantic Studios. She understood right away that it was our duty as journalists to shine a light on this movement, to really pay attention to it, and to expose what was happening. So. It began with a few um, short documentary profiles and written articles. I was actually the guy who caught a room full of people breaking out into Nazi salutes a week after uh, President Trump won the election. And that was a really clarifying moment in the press because it solidified that this wasn't, you know, a, an edgy new kind of conservatism. That was the way the alt-right was talked about at the time. It was fundamentally a racist movement, an anti-Semitic movement. You know, they were hiling Trump, uh, you know, blocks from the White House using German, you know, lingo and, 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 and quotes from Nazi Germany. So at that point, it was immediately clear that this was a, a very dangerous and violent movement that was only growing in strength. And I think most importantly for me, I was pretty young in the newsroom, Ross, as you know, and Kasha, uh, a lot of people my age were getting sucked into this stuff. So I had a personal fascination that, you know, only leaving college campuses a few years earlier, it was just astounding to me that all these people my age coming from similar, you know, middle class backgrounds were being radicalized by these ideas. Um, so I brought it to Kasha and then eventually we talked to Jeff. When Charlottesville happened um, <clears throat> eight months later, we understood that it had to go deeper than just short investigations. And from there, it became a, a feature length film. Hmm. Kasha, do you remember when Daniel first came to you with this idea? And can you talk about what you thought about the idea at first and what compelled you to say, okay, this is, this is it. This is going to be the Atlantic's first feature length doc. I remember it uh, clearly. It was the summer of 2016 and the alt-right was not a household term yet, but I have a younger brother who is a busy Reddit user. And he had warned me that, that something was something scary was starting to happen in social media. And so I asked Daniel to look into it and he proposed the profile of Richard Spencer following him the week after the election. And that was the short documentary that led to our viral footage of Nazi salutes in Washington, DC that went all around the world. Um, and it was around that time that Atlantic Studios, our in-house production division at the Atlantic was looking to do its first feature film. So we were looking for a topic that would lend itself to deeper investigation. Um, and Daniel's alt-right reporting was a clear front runner for that project. And so in 2017, when Charlottesville happened, we mobilized um, and started sending Daniel out to uh, gain access to a broader array of subjects. Mm. Adam, uh, I wanna bring you into the conversation. Daniel and Kasha both invoked Trump's rise as part of the motivating impulse to make this film. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the politics of this movement. Um, until Donald, Donald Trump, uh, you know, most mainstream political leaders kept the white nationalist movement at arm's length. Um, and uh, he was a bit of an outlier in that he sort of embraced them wholesale. And I'm wondering if you see that as a sort of temporary regression or if we're gonna have a kind of new openly white supremacist strain that's kind of here to stay in American mainstream politics. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting because, you know, a lot of Democrats, um, if you ask them, you know, what role did Trump play in, in all of this and kind of emboldening uh, the alt right or the far right? Um, and they will they will quickly say that he, he played a massive role in kind of legitimizing it um, and failing to crack down on it. Um, you know, you, you look across 
the reports that were published by um, various agencies that said that um, homegrown extremism was one of the most uh, uh, severe threats to America. Uh, you know, those those reports kind of came out consistently, and and I think what uh, you know, it, it's kind of like an unboxing, right? When you, when you take it out of the box, it's really difficult to to put it back. And so, for um, kind of as we as we move forward, you know, you saw the insurrection on on January six. You've seen the Biden administration say that they want to crack down on um, kind of extremism, on kind of the strain of politics that is that is kind of um, corrupting um, our democracy. Um, but it's it's going to be really difficult. You know, a lot of the methods that we have of of uh, policing, uh, this is, is, um, uh, is antiquated. We are, our methods for, for policing um, the far right are, are antiquated or, or for policing um, domestic extremism are antiquated. So, so until there are uh, kind of revolutionized ways of, of addressing this, I think that this will be a consistent um, strain in American politics as it has been um, in the past. You saw it right after reconstruction, you saw it um, during the civil rights movement. This is not something that is, um, brand new it's, it's just something that goes dormant and then it, it comes around and, and cycles mm. daniel uh all journalists sort of struggle with letting their personal feelings about a subject influence their coverage approach um but this strikes me as kind of a particular struggle in this case can you talk a little bit about how you got access to these people um and just what it was like for you personally to spend so much time in intimate quarters with them it's a very difficult process. I think it's one that I'm actually just making sense of now as I talk about the film and, and, and write about it. You know, I'm, I'm Jewish, my last name wouldn't imply, but I am. And both my grandmothers are Holocaust survivors, one from uh, Germany and one from Poland. I grew up very close to them and was really influenced by them and their worldview. Really actually the, the only break I took in the three-year reporting process was to go back to Poland where one of my grandmothers fled in 1939 and we revisited her childhood home and she had only been there once um, she went in the 80s with with her husband my grandfather so i'm very attached to this material it, you know it hits at it hits an emotional chord but i don't think that influenced my reporting in any way i mean i'm i guess old school in my belief that i think the role of journalists is to is to I'm careful with the word objective but to get as close to the truth as possible to really be in the room the premise of the project was to get unprecedented access inside the movement to really create a historical document so people could look back and say, wow, like, I cannot believe this happened. I can't believe this was surging to such an extent to really be there to witness it and to show it. That was very, very difficult to achieve. I mean, Spencer is easier. That's why he's in everything. But getting that kind of access to him was tough. I mean, I went skiing with him. I you know, was in the, went on a road trip with him to a college event that went terribly wrong and his car broke down and we ended up at a gas station. I mean, they're like endless, ridiculous stories along the way. And getting that kind of unfiltered access was very difficult. Cernovich was a little bit harder. His wife, who's Persian and adds a lot of interesting complexity was even harder. And Lauren Southern never does any press. It took eight months to get access to her. And that was really the key to the project. When, when Kasha and I realized Lauren committed, that was when we knew we had a feature because it's so rare to have a female face of racism and someone who's so young and embodies my generation so well, youth radicalization. So when we locked down Lauren, that's when we knew we had a film. And it was just really like old fashioned shoe leather reporting persistence. I just kept showing up and tell, you know showing that I was sincere and wanting to understand them. And Eventually, I guess I wore them down um, with that with that effort. Hmm. Yeah, Masha, can you tell us a little bit about the conversations that you and Daniel had about character selection? Like, what made you all choose these three people as being kind of the representative on-screen subject for this movement? That's a great question because obviously it's a sprawling, fractured movement, and there are a whole spectrum of individuals who are influential in amplifying these ideas. Um, first and foremost, we took very seriously the concern that we might inadvertently provide a platform for the alt-right and for extremism. So first and foremost, we made very sure to cover this movement through a highly critical lens. We would be accurate, but there would be no ambiguity about the fact that this was a critical project. Um, and when you watch the film, I think there's no question in the viewer's mind that this um, film is both critical of their messages and, and of their impact of the fact that these messages have bled into the mainstream and are um, in part responsible for rising hate and violence around the world. And you see Daniel 
putting those questions directly to the subjects in the film and you see their answers. And so when we reviewed all the subjects, Daniel originally filmed with a couple dozen subjects all over the US, but we singled out those who already had followings in the millions. Yeah. Um, we, we stayed away from fringe characters who might use this film as an opportunity to get famous. We focused on those who are already shaping the conversation yeah. so that regardless of whether or not we made the film, they were already having a huge impact um, on the conversation and our film could do a service in shedding a light on them, how they operated, how they brought their messages to the mainstream and why their messages were so appealing to their fans. Hmm. And as Daniel pointed out, we focused on these three because we wanted to have a female perspective. Misogyny is, is such a big part of the alt-right. We focus on the white nationalism, but it goes hand in hand with the anti-feminist agenda. Um, so focusing on a female influencer and her experiences um, was, uh, I think, something that our film does uniquely well. Hmm. Um, I want to get to some audience questions in a second, but Adam, first, before I go uh, there, let's talk a little bit about QAnon. Um, you know, the, the subcultures of the kind of far right are sort of in a constant state of evolution and dynamism, uh, as are all cultures. And so sometimes it can be hard to sort of like understand where they kind of fit the connections between them. And so I was wondering, do you, having reported on, the, on these types of groups, do you see QAnon as a kind of explicitly white nationalist movement, or is it just sort of white nationalist adjacent by virtue of the Trump connection? I would say the latter, kind of um, white nationalist adjacent um, as, a, as, as part of the Trump um, connection. But uh, I, I should qualify that, that, that it seems, you know, within Q, it's like tiers of belief, right? You have some of the folks who are true believers who now are saying, you know, after all of these times of being misled, we're no longer true believers in it. But then you also have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is now a member of Congress and who is continuing to kind of espouse some of these um, Q adjacent beliefs or or purely Q beliefs. So um, I think that, that some of the same, um, it's like they're running on parallel tracks, right? Some of the same, um, trends that, that underline um, white nationalism are some of the same trends that underline and, and prop up um, the Q, uh, some of the Q beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from Mark in the chat, which is, Daniel, did you, did the three subjects know that you were Jewish and that your grandparents were Holocaust survivors? They did. I never hid it from them, but I wouldn't go out of my way to uh, tell them. You know, I think if my last name was Goldstein, I might have had a harder time getting into the room with them. Um, Richard found out a year into the reporting process, we were on the way to a speech. It was the one where the car broke down, as I mentioned. It was a really long drive, and he asked for more about my Italian ancestry, because my last name sounds Italian. And in there, you know, I, I was stuck two hours left in the drive, so I said, actually, I'm Jewish. My dad's from Israel. My grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And he was at a loss for words, and I think more funny to me was the driver was a kid my age mm -hmm. probably had not met many Jews before and was just terrified clutching the wheel looking at me in the rearview mirror the rest of the ride um and eventually we got to where Richard was staying and it took a little bit of a dark turn because a lot of the kids were younger and less inhibited than he the leaders are very press savvy and they're you know they wouldn't be throwing Nazi salutes to my face but a lot of the kids mm -hmm. who were younger who are less you know used to who are less media trained don't care as much. So when I got there, I dealt with a lot of, um, you know, anti-Semitic abuse. The other two subjects, Lauren uses a lot of dog whistles talking about things that we hear about all the time now, the globalists, Soros, the Rothschilds. A lot of that stuff is actually QAnon adjacent, like, like Adam was saying, they talk about a deep state conspiracy and oftentimes that implies Jews. Mm. Cernovich's world is interesting because he's very right wing, but he's skilled at kind of dog whistling at white nationalism, but not fully embracing it. And the film, I think, does a good job of showing how he uses racism to build a brand. But then when it gets bad, he opportunistically moves away from it. So he's actually able to attract somewhat of a Jewish audience. And around him, it was uh, less difficult. He was, he was much more open. Yeah, yeah. What was your, uh, James Farley has a question in the chat, which is, uh, what was your level of nervousness, um, which you're kind of getting to just now, but in covering these groups, like were you ever 
concerned about your personal safety. And I guess I would open that up to you and Kasha yeah. now that the film has been released. Uh, how has the alt-right itself, you know, sort of received this film? And have you two been the targets of any harassment, digital or otherwise? During the reporting process, it actually wasn't bad. You know, I kept my journalistic distance always. I, anytime they would try to come too close to me, I would remind them I'm not a friend. I'm not your therapist. I'm not here to support you. Um, you know, I kept my distance. I think the sense of betrayal really mm -hmm. hit in when the film came out and when the article came out on, on Lauren Southern. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it's holding a mirror to the movement and it really exposes them as, you know, contradictory hypocrites who really uphold very few of the values that they, they claim to espouse. They have not received it well. The wider movement hasn't received it well. To me, that shows that the film is effective, you know. Um, but it hasn't been a fun time. So since the movie's come out, it's been a lot worse actually than during the reporting process because somehow I was able to kind of sneak under the radar for those three years. Mm. Yeah. Um, this is a really a question for Adam and, and Daniel, but how do you think these movements and I mean, using movements quite broadly, perhaps even including QAnon, um, will fare during a Biden administration? Um, it, you know, will they wilt without support from the White House or will being shut out of institutional power kind of inflame them into something worse uh, or play into the sort of grievances that can be really motivating? Yeah, um, so I guess if you're kind of looking at, at this in terms of historical analogs, um, you know, kind of being shut out of power, what did white supremacists do when they were shut out of power? Um, and Reconstruction, um, that's how you end up getting the Nadir um, and, and kind of the Redeemers coming in and, and, and using explicit violence in, in order to, to take back power. Um, you have events from, from race riots in, um, in Eufaula and Mobile and, um, you know, you have the, the coup in, in North Carolina. So at, at its extreme end, right, that's what um, that looks like. But, you know, in, in you know, President Biden's uh, inauguration address, he, he explicitly calls out white supremacy, right? He says, um, you know, the rise of political extremism, white supremacy and domestic terrorism, um, you know, won't be tolerated in this administration. So they're actively working to sort of root this out before it turns into something um, more extreme. Mm -hmm. You know, the Biden administration is doing a good job setting the tone from his inauguration address. But I don't see this stuff going anywhere. I mean, the Republican Trump is still, you know, Trumpism is still the ideology of the Republican Party. There was a moment around January 6th where it seemed like they might have been pivoting away from it. But, you know, McCarthy just went to Mar-a-Lago and is, has been photographed with Trump. Everyone seems to be doubling down on the populism. And I think more importantly for me, from what I've witnessed, young people are much more excited about the Trumpist strain of conservatism okay. than, than the Mitt Romney or the Susan Collins strain of conservatism. So there might be some never Trumpers who might, you know, who more like, see more like a Joe Manchin than they do a Trump, but those are few and far between. And the party, I think with time will come to resemble Trump even if he doesn't run again in 2024. Mm. And, yeah. and actually, to Daniel's point about kind of Trumpism being the dominant strain and people being more attracted to it, um, you know, even even with, you know, the leaders, right? So, um, you know, after, you know, Representative Green's remarks from the past kind of resurfaced over the last several days, um, uh, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, of course, went down to see Trump, but then he also uh, was sending around a statement through a spokesman. Um, to reporters who inquired about the remarks, whether or not that meant that she should be removed from committees. I, I sent him a, uh, I sent his spokesman an email and he responded, you know, uh, we, uh, the speaker is deeply disturbed by these comments and he will have a conversation um, <laughs> with, with Representative Green. And, you know, you speak to Democrats. I, I spoke with um, Representative Johanna um, Hayes this weekend, uh, who represents Newtown, right? She represents uh, the district that, uh, um, um, Representative Green has called the false flag operation um, that, that, that she said that, that maybe Newtown has, has not happened. Um, and, you know, her response is a conversation isn't good enough. Um, you know, the Republican Party needs to you know, root this out and it's not something that they've shown a willingness um, or, or a desire at all to do. 
I have a question from Catherine in the Q&A. Uh, she says it's almost uh, ironic that all three of these folks um, chose non-white or immigrant spouses uh, and that to her that that hypocrisy suggests that all of them are in it just for a kind of fame and power um, and don't actually believe in what they espouse. Daniel, you really saw that sort of up close. What do you make of that kind of uh, seeming hypocrisy? Ideology is a spectrum. I mean, Richard is a believer. Uh, you know, Cernovich is the most is an opportunist. People call him a grifter. Richard even calls him a grifter in the film, which is a funny moment. Lauren is somewhere in between. And I think the reason we chose those three characters to Kasha's point is they really capture, it's not a monolith. It really is a spectrum. And you have people who are Trumpy and, and flirt with white nationalism. You have people who really are white nationalists. And what's so dangerous about this moment is that they're really in a coalition together for the first time. That these people who are on the right, right, the Spencers of the world, had been maybe not Richard himself, but his followers had been welcomed into the party and into the movement for the past four years. And, and it seems like now will continue to be welcomed in. That being said, the internet incentivizes all sorts of awful behavior as everyone knows. And it's easy to monetize any kind of fame to you know, use a platform to get rich, to build a brand. And you see in the film that all of them leverage the audience that they've built through racism or through misogyny to get rich and famous. So Mike Cernovich built a brand by claiming that Hillary Clinton had Parkinson's in the 2016 election. He pushed the Pizzagate narrative. He was a leading conspiracy theorist. And a lot of the QAnon stuff we see really started with people like Cernovich who were pushing you know, so-called deep state pedophilia conspiracies in, in 2015 and 2016. He built his celebrity status off of that. He was a struggling lawyer in California, hit it big on Twitter, all of a sudden was basically a public person. And then he, when, when the racism became difficult to sell as a commodity after Charlottesville, he pivoted away from it. So now he's, he still dabbles in it, but he's selling facial serums. He's doing like workshops for men. And it's a very common narrative where even a guy like Ben Shapiro, who obviously is a smart guy, even if you disagree with him, but at the end of a segment, he'll you know, flaunt his, uh, his pills that he's selling or other, uh, other things. And, we live in a space now where celebrity can be commodified and it doesn't really matter how you achieve it. And I think the last point, sorry to ramble here is no. it's really a, it's an, it's clear that even if they believe it, they're intoxicated by the fame. I mean, it's really deeply emotional for them. Richard Spencer dreamed of being an avant-garde theater director. He was never good at theater or good at acting. So in a way, this is sort of like his great performance, you know, and mm. that's another way to interpret what's happening. Tasha, I want to ask you, uh, when you were helping, you know, as someone who's sort of looking over uh, Daniel's shoulder and, and kind of um, helping him along during, during the production process and, and really in the editing, um, talk to us a little bit about the tougher creative choices, like things that ended up on the cutting room floor that, you know, you knew had to go to make a sort of this really slick and kind of well done streamlined product, uh, but that you wanted to explore more. Thank you. Uh, it was definitely a challenging process to pull together. Daniel shot something like 300 hours of footage. Um, so we had an incredible wealth of material and, and a large spectrum of, of events and, and subjects. But over the three years that Daniel filmed, it's these sort of key arcs sort of emerged for our three main subjects. So we worked with an incredible editor, Carlos Rojas Feliz, um, to really shape the personal stories of these three subjects. At first, when we set out to produce the film, we didn't know if it would take the form of a verite follow doc, which it ultimately became. We considered um, integrating uh, interviews with experts um, from different academic backgrounds to sort of add context about the movement and to the history of white nationalism. But as we dug into the footage, we saw that we had such immersive material that really captured um, these personalities, both in their public lives, as you normally see them in the media and on their own social feeds, but also in their private lives, where the sort of facade that they normally present falls away. Um, those moments of um, behind the scenes um, where they let their guards down and reveal the hypocrisies and inconsistencies of their worldviews. As one viewer mentioned, they're, they're partners um, aren't who you might expect them to be based on their rhetoric. Um, and so that was a big decision that we ultimately made in the edit was that we would 
we had something unique to offer our audience by emerging um, the viewer in their personal stories and that using experts would um, sort of burst the bubble and take them out of that immersive experience and that the value of being immersed isn't that you got to see the movement from the inside looking out, which is a term Daniel's used and I think it's really apt. Um, there's so much media that dissects this movement. There are great experts, there are great documentaries that um, will break it down, sort of telling you what it is from the outside looking in. But this is one film that I think helps people to see why fans flock to these people and why they're ultimately so dangerous. Daniel um, and, and Adam really also, do, uh, Joanne Swanson has a really interesting question in the Q&A. Um, she wonders if you have suggestions for how to have conversations with sort of friends and family members who might be flirting with, you know, you catch people early stage when they're just flirting with some of these ideas. Um, maybe they've fallen down a YouTube rabbit hole or, or whatever it may be. Um, and uh, just uh, you two having sort of seen these communities up close, um, is there is there anything that that you can do kind of at that early stage, or did you see people sort of be persuaded out of it um, uh, in real time at all? It's very difficult to persuade someone out of it in real time. Now that I've covered the movement, I guess going on five years, there are some subjects who I knew who were deep in it and have since renounced it. So mm. one is named Kalen Robertson. He's Lauren's filmmaker in the film. He's a young British filmmaker and he's a very skilled propagandist. So he really kind of created her defining aesthetic and, and helped her go big on YouTube. When I met him, he was all in, but starting to have some questions. And over the past year and a half or something, he's really come to regret um, his position. And there are other people in the movement, but it takes a long time because once you're in it deep, it's not just a worldview, it's, it's your family, it's your community, it's your friends. I think that's something people fail to understand that it provides everything that other people would have in their normal life. So it's positive reinforcement. It's the way you dress. It's the way you look. All your group chats are other people who believe these ideas. So you get into it so deeply that you struggle to find a way out. And I think, you know, there's, there are many things you can do. It's very difficult. I think it's important to have some empathy and to try to talk to people and to really try to help them understand how they arrived at that conclusion. And I think Oftentimes when you meet them, you realize that they don't really, they believe these things, but actually it's just hitting them at some psychoanalytical level that they're looking for a community to belong to. They're looking for a sense of purpose in the world. That does not exonerate them at all. I mean, they're still pushing horrible, dangerous ideas, but when you're able to get to that place with them, you can kind of start to reprogram them in a way and say, well, what if you pursued, you can find that same sense of purpose and community in, in anything, in a, in a metalhead group or in like a, left-wing act, there are so many ways you could find that same feeling. And what's shocking to me is how many people are finding it in, in, in white nationalism. Um, so for me, it starts with understanding and just trying to push people in the right direction. Yeah, yeah the only thing that I would add there um, is kind of, I, I touched on this a bit at the beginning, but um, just the way that um, people develop these um, ideologies in real time. It's kind of the, the classic case of, of how someone is radicalized um, online. And, and when, you know, talking to officials, um, you know, home, homeland security experts, um, folks who are trying to figure out about um, domestic extrem extremism and how folks are, are radicalized, when they talk about why the systems are so antiquated, it's because they don't know how to combat the spread on social media, um, on, on some of these in, in private group chats, Mm -hmm. um, that they're not able to identify readily. Um, and so kind of updating those approaches um, may help with some of that uh, kind of real time um, uh, de-radicalization. Mm -hmm. uh, Peggy Crow has an interesting question. Uh, she asks, she says that the, the film really dramatized the downfall of all these three leaders um, more, I mean, or the, the pivot to supplements. Uh, yes. <laughs> But uh, who's kind of driving the train of the alt-right now? Have, have new leaders sort of um, emerged to take the place of, of Spencer and Lauren Southern, et cetera? Yeah, there's definitely a new generation of influencers who are even more hard-edged than them. And I think more importantly, more skilled at kind of walking the line. Richard's 
ultimate flaw was that he was horrible at optics. He didn't understand that if you throw a Nazi salute down the street from the White House, it's not good for your brand. <laughs> if you, you know, incite violence in Charlottesville, it's not a good thing. And the three figures in the film who closely associated with that movement are all now in, ret are all now in retreat um, to various extents. There's been a, there's a really big lawsuit called Signs v. Kessler alleging a criminal conspiracy in Charlottesville. And that's crippled a lot of the people um, financially. So they're, st they're struggling to raise money. A lot of them have been kicked off of um, social media, kicked off of fundraising platforms. Um, so all of them are in retreat to some extent. I think what's scary is that there are younger influencers. A guy like Nick Fuentes, who's 22, dropped out of Boston College, marched in mm -hmm. Charlottesville. He gave a big speech um, at the Capitol on January 6th and has a new movement called the Groypers. And they're similar, it's highly educated upper middle class kids who really believe this is a white man's country and are, are ready to fight and die for it. I, he's a domestic terrorist and he has thousands of people who watch his show America First every night. He raises thousands of dollars online. He lives off of fundraising. There are many more people like that. I mean, I don't wanna shout out too many people but there are even younger people you see now who are 13 and 14, almost like kind of in the TikTok sphere who are using a lot of the kind of dog whistles that Lauren really pioneered, you know, using irony and humor, but really being as deeply Islamophobic, deeply racist. So it's a current that we're, that we're dealing with and is actually only becoming more sophisticated on social media. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Nancy Colonius asks, uh, to what extent does fundamentalist religion play a role in the white supremacy movement? Um, it didn't seem there wasn't a lot of that in the film, but I'm wondering is is that part of this movie? It's certainly part of QAnon. He'll know. There's a long history of white supremacy and 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 the church, especially. There's a great new book by Robert Jones about the long heritage of evangelical Christianity and and white supremacy and how a lot of evangelical churches supported and upheld white supremacy in the South. The alt-right, as I came to know it, is actually pretty secular, pretty non-religious. They use Christianity as a way to kind of create a group identity. So many of them will say that they're cultural Christians. All that really means is it's just a way to say we're not Muslim or Jewish. Um, I even went to church with one of the subjects and she struggled to follow along. Like I, as a Jew, as a Jew, I knew more than, than she did in the service. Um, so it's not, it's, it's religious when convenient, but Adam would probably know better. Like big picture, there's a long history of, of religious involvement in, in white supremacy. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, even going back to, to slavery, I mean, Christianity was used to plot, prop up slavery. Um, one of the subjects that I ended up writing about in my book um, talks about how he converted to abolitionism and um, how his parents were, were deeply disturbed and said that, that you weren't, um, you're not being religious if, you, if you're, uh, you know, God has kind of created uh, a class of people who who, who um, uh, are naturally supposed to be subservient to him, and, and and he was sort of disowned from his family for for this. Um, so so kind of Christian nationalism in, in a lot of ways has has always dovetailed with white supremacy in, in the United States and abroad. Hmm. Um, Corbett has an interesting question. Uh, he asks, what parallels, if any, do you see between Lawrence Southern and Marjorie Taylor Greene? Yeah. Honest. You can't hear you. Again. You, you can't go. hear me. No, you can't. Okay. She seems a little bit more unhinged, to be honest. Mm. Uh, Lauren's real skill is that she has an intuitive understanding of the internet. She hit it big when she was 19. She dropped out of community college, started putting out these, you know, ridiculous, provocative videos. First, as an anti-feminist activist, one of her first big videos was to go to a feminist march and hold a sign saying there is no rape culture, which is obviously a horrible and provocative thing to do. But in our modern internet ecosystem, it does very well online. That video I think has 3 million views and then eventually evolved into more of an anti-migrant activist. Lauren is very savvy in a way that I don't know the Congresswoman is. Um, she's talking about Jewish space lasers and <laughs> um, all, she's had a lot of gaffes um, that I think reflect um, an amateurism in her politics. What's shocking though is, look, we said the GOP has not um, criticized her for it publicly. 
a few big groups have like the Republican Jewish coalition and others, but the GOP leadership has not really criticized her. Um, I think the real overlap apart from them both being women is that they have a, a populist style and they like to appeal to emotion. And I think that's the wider trend is that conservative politics, populism obviously is rising on the left and the right, but right, right wing populism is deeply emotional. It's appealing to the heart and it's really, um, you know, inciting people in a, in a, in a dangerous and, and violent way. And, and that's a similarity between the two of them. Tasha, I want to ask you, um, how has the, uh, the sort of ups and downs of our recent politics and particularly the January 6th, uh, insurrection, uh, how has that played out? And as you all are trying to promote this film, um, at the same time and, and really push it out to distributors, has that sort of made these conversations easier or harder? Working for The Atlantic, as our subscribers know, you have this sort of long view of history. We have more than 160 years of experience covering race in America. And one thing we knew going into this project was unfortunately that American racism has always been with us and will continue to be with us. So unfortunately, we weren't surprised when Charlottesville happened and we weren't surprised when the Capitol riots happened. And we recognized the violent messages that Daniel had documented right after the election in 2016, bubbling up at every step along the way. So it was disappointing, obviously, and, and horrifying to see these events, but to, to recognize that the themes we covered in our film had both this long history and sadly a long future um, was something that we expected. And there is a little bit of an irony because before we released the film. We released the film in October, right before the, the recent election. But before we released the film, we were speaking with distributors and funders and many people genuinely thought the film would lose relevance after the election. They thought Joe Biden would get elected and domestic terrorism, white nationalism would fade from the news. And that clearly was not the case. So um, it has been gratifying to see the audience response to the film um, the, the press we've gotten, the, the critical response has been incredible. Um, so we're just grateful that the film can help contribute to the conversation and, and to our readers' understanding of this issue. Uh, Daniel, how did, uh, what did it, uh, this is a, a question from Derek Frost, but what did you make of the fact that there are some gay and Jewish and black supporters uh, that, that are in the film? Um, uh, and, and what kind of dissonance is at work there? And, and what did they say when you talked to them? And what is their worldview like? It's a very difficult question. Um, you know, people are capable of internalizing all sorts of beliefs. So you would meet, I would meet women who've internalized really strong sexism, like the belief that men are actually inherently better than women and that not just like the Phyllis Schlafly stuff that women should be in domestic spheres, but that men are fundamentally better. I also met Jewish people and African-Americans who actually believed that, you know, white Christians were the superior race. Um, there's a, in the, in the first viral clip, um, the, the Hail Trump salutes, a Sikh man actually throws a Nazi salute, which uh, there are like several subreddits devoted to figuring out how that happened. Um, and, you know, I think it all, political movements, you have to build a coalition, right? I mean, if it's just this country is 65% is white and every year is becoming more diverse, if it's purely, you know, whiteness historically was just Western European whiteness, the notion of whiteness, uh, as Richard and others understand it, continues to expand. So now it includes Italians, it includes Eastern Europeans and Slavs and Russians and other groups that historically would have been excluded, basically because they need numbers. And I think when you go inside this world, you also meet, sometimes they'll, you know, turn a blind eye and allow someone who's Jewish or allow someone who's black or whatever to be a part of that movement because it allows them from a marketing perspective to say, look, this, this attracts all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life. Sure, in the eventual ethno state, they might have to leave, but, you know, they understand the importance of, of these ideas. It's really sad to say, but I mean, they're, they're being tokenized deeply, um, you know, and, and it's, it's a shame. And, you know, I even met some Orthodox Jews who were there and I would walk up to them and say, don't you understand what these people believe and what the logical end of these beliefs is? And 
somehow they would they would skirt that that question and avoid it. The whole movement is filled with dissonance, though. I mean, it's 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 things you've talked about that they have biracial kids, even though they tweet things like diversity is code word for white genocide. So it's it's a big sprawling movement that wants to go mainstream and they'll pick up any allies they can. And it's a sad reality sometimes that there are allies that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Mm. Yeah. Um, before we go, I want to ask uh, one last question uh, for Akasha and Daniel, which is how basically sort of how you arrived at the title of White Noise and mm -hmm. also just what you hope people will take away from the film. It was one of those late night ideas that sort of pops into your head and you're like, hmm, could this work? And then I sort of threw it at the bottom of a long, long Google doc of title ideas and forgot about it. And then Daniel and our editor found it a few days later and, and it really clicked for them. It was Kasha's brilliant idea. And then I had to convince her that it was the right idea, even though it was her idea. <laughs> she put it on the sheet. Um, yeah. Um, Ultimately, it sort of captured something that we were seeing, which was that there it, it's such a spectrum, right? From the hardline extremists, from the Nazi salutes in Washington, D.C., to the sort of mundane, everyday Twitter behavior of people on the far right who don't consider themselves white nationalists, but are doing so much to amplify these ideas. Um, white noise seemed to capture all of that. Before we go, can you guys tell us also about the, uh, the future of the film's distribution? So it's available on um, Amazon, Google Play, and iTunes, Apple TV, and Vimeo um, right now in the US. And we're working with an international sales agent to bring it to other countries around the world. Daniel, yeah. were there any other updates on that front that we can share at this stage? Uh, we're, we doing, we're doing an educational screening tour. So if anyone wants to bring the film to their community and have a dialogue, um, we would love that and invite that. We have an event at Duke coming up and University of Denver and many other schools. Um, we have a Canadian premiere coming up. So we're slowly bringing it to every country and uh, within a few months should be widely available around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, that wraps our program today. Uh, thank you, Adam, Kasha and Daniel for being here. and. Um, Thank you to all our subscribers for your continued support of The Atlantic's journalism. If you haven't seen White Noise, uh, as Kasha said, you can get it on Amazon or iTunes or Vimeo um, and many more places still to come. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>